Welcome to the San Gorgonio Chapter Trail Talk series. And I am your host, John St. Clair. And uh, tonight's trail talk is Nearby Nature, part two. And uh, Marianne Reese will be the only speaker because our other speaker is unfortunately uh, sick tonight and is not able to join her. Um, I'm going to go over a couple of ground rules. Um, first of all, um, please uh, remain muted during the presentation. And when the presentation is done, at that point, if you want to unmute and, and talk, you can. But during presentation, stay muted. And if you have a question, uh, click on the little talking bubble at the bottom. It says chat and type in uh, your question that you might have. And uh, we'll get back to answer it uh, later on. But that'll help you remember what your question is and, and will give us a heads up uh, that there is a question that needs to be answered. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted tonight on the uh, San Gregorio chapter YouTube channel. So if you have to leave in the middle, uh, you can go back later and, and um, go to YouTube. And the reminder I sent out did have the correct link for the YouTube channel. So you can click on that to get to the San Gregorio chapter YouTube channel to see all of the uh, recordings of the trail talk talks. And so without further ado, I will introduce Mary Ann Reese, who will be our speaker. All right. Oh dear, I'm spotlighted. So I'm going to share my screen. And um, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we have a relatively small group. Um, we've got people from all over the place. And uh, thanks for coming. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, start this program. I'm sure this works. All right, so we can move past this slide because we're already starting. All right. So uh, again, welcome to Sierra Club San Gregorio Chapters Trail Talk series. I uh, just want to give a little bit of a shout out to John and his partners, um, Julianne Anderson, who's away on vacation, and Carla, who is ill, our outings leaders, who when we started, um, when COVID happened and we had to stop all of our outings, they said, let's keep connected with our members with trail talks about, um, you know, various subjects. We've had these going on for over two years now. And don't plan to stop, even though outings are started up again. So I just wanted to give that little shout out. And then uh, one of the things that that uh, we do in, in Sierra Club is try to always acknowledge, you know, the traditional owners of the, the land that we're on and their connection to the land, waters, and the community. You know, we re pay respect to their elders, past and present, and to the pivotal role, really, that Indigenous people continue to play in caring for our land, waters, and wildlife. The San Gregorio chapter, in case you weren't aware, is on the land of the um, Tongva, Chumash, and Quiche, and Tatiavam, and the San Bernardino Yuhaviatam, also known as the Serrano Indian tribe. So we'd just like to acknowledge that in our, in our presentations. You know, as, especially as we got into the first couple years or so, first few months of COVID, we all recognized that outdoors was something we could do. And uh, there's a lot of science about the power of the healing power of nature. And I liked this quote um, from Chief Dan George of the Salai Wild Tooth Nation. Um, and that nature really does this. You can read it yourself, or I, I don't need to read it out loud, but uh, I thought this was a nice uh, thought about how nature heals us and, and uh, just the silence of being in a big open space is really um, wonderful when, when things are, are tough like they've been the last couple of years. Um, this is a picture, and I didn't 
really plan to talk about this one, but this is a, a spot that is not far from us. Um, from now through summer and, and fall, it's, it's probably quite warm there, not a spot that you would want to hike around. But during the fall, winter, and, and spring, this preserve is called Windwolves Preserve. It is the largest private preserve in the state owned and managed by the largest conservancy, the Wildlands Conservancy. It's over 90,000 acres, uh, and it is uh, just over the um, over the hill as you take the five, Interstate 5 up over the ridge route and down into the um, Inland Valley up there. Um, this is called Wind Wolves, and it goes from fairly low landscape up into uh, six or 7,000 foot mountains. It's just a really beautiful and interesting preserve. Um, when we get to a better time to go visit, like maybe in, in the winter, this might be one we would highlight and talk about further in a, um, in a trail talk. So moving on, um, you know, nature-based recreation is booming. It really is. I, I looked up some statistics and uh, Zion National Park hit a record. 5 million visitors in 2021. They actually, John Zion edged out Yellowstone as the second highest park for visitation. The first has been uh, Great Smoky Mountains for years. Joshua Tree had over 3 million visitors. Um, Recreation.gov, the uh, website that you use to make campground reservations, the reservations there increase. You know, they kind of went up every year. Um, Oops, I'm on the wrong. Huh, interesting. Anyway, they rose from 3 million and, you know, gradually up to 3 million in 2019, five and a half million in 2020, and almost doubled. I'm not sure. Are you able to see this whole slide? There we go. Yes, yes. Okay, good. Um, almost doubled in uh, 2021 to 9 million reservations. Now, granted, uh, more campgrounds put in reservations. You had to reserve a spot to go into Yosemite. There were there were more, but still, that's that's almost doubled. So that that's huge. Um, sales of kayaks went up thirty percent in a year from May twenty twenty to May of twenty twenty one, and backpacking tent sales went up fifty percent in that same time. So people are really getting outdoors. They're overrunning uh, our national parks, and. Um, it could be very crowded and difficult to find a place to go. So we're going to talk tonight about um, some of the places nearby us that we can go to, not so much for um, major big hiking, uh, because it is getting into the hot season, and that pretty much means going up into the mountains if you want to hike and uh, you know be pretty strenuous. But um, there's a lot of places around here where one can enjoy a um, you know shady spot for a picnic. And we'll start kind of with the Santa Ana River watershed. Uh, it, it runs through our whole two counties of Riverside and San Bernardino County that make up the San Gregonio chapter. And um, you know, actually Carla had planned to talk about some of the, the mountain areas uh, um, up where she lives and then in this watershed. So maybe we'll stop at the end of this section about the Santa Ana River and answer some questions or take suggestions from folks that might have ideas about recreation in the, in the San Bernardino National Forest. But we're gonna talk about the areas down below the mountains to begin with, as far as places to spend some time uh, outdoors in the summer. Um, one of those spots that is very accessible to us in the urban areas, and I live in Chino, I'm not sure where everyone else here is, is from, but um, getting to a spot quickly without a lot of travel time can be a, a, a real benefit. The Santa Ana River Trail, and this is one that I actually have not, have not hiked along this area, but it, in Riverside, it starts in Fairmount Park in Europa Valley, and you can follow this trail along the river for 12.8 miles, that's a long trail. It goes along the Santa Ana River, uh, winds through the Martha McLean Anza, um, Anza 
Narrows Park, uh, parallels the Santa Ana River Wildlife Area, and then it ends up at Van Buren Avenue in Norco. So this is a long urban trail along a river watershed that you would see, um, you know, there's probably trees and green space, some wildlife, there's an actual wildlife area across the river. So this would be a, a spot that folks in the urban area could get to on a, on a weekday or a weekend without a lot of trouble or even an evening hike. And then as you go further along the, the river, um, down into Riverside and Norco, there's the Hidden Valley Nature Center, which is open on weekends. And then there's a bunch of trails through the Hidden Valley Wildlife Center. And that is further um, down this trail, not on this map. Um, these, I'm gonna go on to the next slide and kind of give a better picture of, of this wetlands and river watershed. So we were up in the far side of the right hand part of this slide in Riverside. This is the Santa Ana River watershed coming down across the 15 and into Prado Basin. And there's other streams. There's um, the Cucamonga Creek connects to Mill Creek here. And Chino Creek also comes into Prado Basin. There's some small local wetlands park, uh, Chino Creek wetlands and Mill Creek wetlands that are in this watershed and have trails, open space and wildlife especially during fall and the winter migration. Oops, next one. Prado Regional Park is just above this watershed, above the Prado Dam. And um, it's got low, a very large wetland. It's got um, a big lake there, camping, boating, fishing. It's a county park. There's a fee, a carload entrance fee of, I believe it's $10 a carload. And um, at the dam that I mentioned earlier down at the, in Prado Wetlands, um, the Santa Ana River Trail picks up and continues all the way along the river to the ocean. But this Prado Regional Park is quite a gem. Uh, I don't know if folks have been there, um, but it's a really nice place to just go and spend an afternoon with your family, picnic. There's picnic shelters, there's lots of shade trees. And you can get a little boat and go out and have little rental boats, I think, still, and uh, fish. A lot of families spend time there. So that's a, a nice nearby nature area. I mentioned earlier the Chino Creek and the Mill Creek wetlands. These are in, well, Chino Creek is in Chino. Uh, Mill Creek is in um, Eastvale, above the uh, dam area, but below Prado Park. And as you can see, they're full of water. Um, they're part of the uh, Prado Basin Water Conservation Area, where some of this water comes through and is spread out to go into settling ponds. Um, and, and recharge the groundwater. But these are really nice places, especially during the fall when there's a lot of um, migration of birds. And also um, in the spring, you might see like this uh, great blue heron. These are huge birds and they build their nests up at the top of trees like this. It looks like a really flimsy little nest for such a big bird, but um, that's what they do. I, last time I was there in the springtime to, to see this, there were like six big nests in trees along the uh, south end of Prado Lake. Pretty cool to see. So this is a nice nearby nature park. I thought I'd stop here before we move into kind of the next section of our um, county areas. Does anyone have any questions or comments or Anything you'd like to, to say about um, uh, this area or questions about it? So uh, can you hear me, Marianne? Yes. Okay, so I uh, went online 
uh, and uh, put in the chat section a link to the Santa Ana River Trail in the San Bernardino National Forest. It's 33 miles long and it follows the Santa Ana River uh, for quite a ways in the San Bernardino National Forest. And that's, that's a, a, a nice place to hike. That would be better in the summertime when you get up into the mountains, it would be not so hot as down here. Well, uh, yeah, when you're up in the upper part, but I mean, it, it starts right at Morton Peak, which is kind of a, a foothill mm -hmm. and goes all the way up into the mountains. So uh, the lower elevations would be warm in the summer, yeah. but usually most of it is in the shade. So uh, it's not too bad. Nice. I see um, uh, Lori mentioned that Pomona Valley Audubon has birding trips there and uh, Let's see, I think there's one other comment here. Yeah, okay. So we'll go ahead and move on um, to the next area that I'm gonna talk about. And this is another watershed. It's also from San Bernardino Mountains, the San Bernardino National Forest, but it's on the, on the other side, other side of the mountains. Um, I'd be curious to see how many folks have been to Whitewater Preserve in the San Gregorio Pass area. Maybe you can just put it in the chat if you've been there. But um, it's a really good example of open space that has been preserved and protected with free access for everyone. Very, you know, within an hour of most of our regional area. Um, the Wildlands Conservancy bought this area and protected it. It's a really important wildlife connectivity area includes a year round river and they saved it from development into a bunch of little mini mansions. It, before um, they bought it, it was an old trout farm and it was being sold for development. There are hiking trails. There's, it's hot right now, I have to warn you, uh, but there is a very shady picnic and camping area. I was out there uh, Friday last week and the Friday before for a couple different events. And uh, it was very pleasant, but in the shade. Um, and it was, there was water running in the river. Um, there's a little um, wading pond right outside of the parking lot that kids love to go and splash around in. The Pacific Trail, Crest Trail goes through this preserve and um, it's quite a place for wildlife. You might get treated to uh, Bighorn sheep sightings up on the hillside. That's, I've seen them many times there. And once in a while, a bear will wander in down the river from the mountains, but I've never seen one, just a big footprint there. But this is a really nice area. It's free uh, donations. They have a box outside for donations, which are appreciated. And um, even in the summer to go there and just cool off in the river is something that families like to do. So it's an important watershed area that's been protected for access. Here's uh, just a picture of one time when uh, I visited there and there's a visitor center. You drive in, there's a visitor center and parking lot. It's just a small building, it's not anything big, but just standing in the parking lot, looking up on the uh, hillside, I, I counted and this herd was 32 sheep. Most, you know, this picture is mostly ewes and lambs. That are just you know getting getting bigger, um, and then another picture of the rams. You can see those big, beautiful curved horns on these guys. There were six rams up there, so this is a good place to go and look at wildlife. Uh, they're open eight to five, um, pretty much every day. Occasionally, there might be some kind of event uh, like the ones I was at, where it's closed for the day, but. Most of the time it's open and you can camp for free if you just call ahead and uh, ask, ask for a reservation. I'm gonna, this, as we look at Whitewater, I wanted to go to a map again. This is the whole general area. Are you able to see my cursor when I put it yes. on the screen here? Okay, good. So we were just at, at Whitewater. Here's the off-ramp on the 10 freeway. There's the Palm Springs Aerial Tramway and, and Cabazon to kind of 
help you orient. Uh, if you haven't been here, the Whitewater Preserve is up this river about four miles. But you can see that this is a big watershed. This is a protected area. Mar this connects to Morongo Valley and over to here, which is Joshua Tree National Park. So connecting these areas is an important part of conservation and, and providing more um, recreational opportunities. So a few years ago in 2016, we were happy to have uh, the Sand to Snow National Monument declared as a new national monument that connects these areas, connects Whitewater to Big Morongo Canyon Preserve up into Joshua Tree. And I'm gonna show you a map next of that, um, of that national monument. So this is the Sand and Snow National Monument. And um, this is the highway that, that I was showing that went up towards um, Yucca Valley. Here's Yucca Valley. Here's the San Bernardino Mountains that are part of Joshua Tree National Park. Here's where we were on the Whitewater River. And you can see there's connection here between these open spaces for wildlife to, to move through. So this is an important part of keeping um, natural spaces wild and keeping the wildlife um, with the ability to connect to their habitat. I also mentioned the Pacific Crest Trail. As you can see, it comes down here from um, Mount San Jacinto, comes along through Whitewater, and then continues on, away, on its way up the, up the mountain crest. So we're next going to talk about another preserve right here in Morongo Valley, the one that connects sand to snow to um, the little San Bernardino Mountains that connect to Joshua Tree. And that is um, the Big Morongo Canyon Preserve. It protects a really unique area, which is kind of like a jungle in the desert. Um, it's full of biodiversity and is a nature preserve that's open to everyone, free access. Um, there are trails that are on a um, boardwalk. You can walk yep. through the preserve without disturbing the wetlands there. It's pretty interesting um, that there is this oasis in the desert. You can see the little San Bernardinos here in the background. Um, the, cottonwood trees. I think this was probably in the fall when this picture was taken. And um, it's managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And there's the Friends of the Morongo Canyon Preserve that, that assist and uh, um, provide literature and um, a, a host at the, at the entrance to, for information. There's a boardwalk that's accessible. Uh, it's a wheelchair accessible for some of the part. Um, this boardwalk keeps you above the, the wetlands that are created by a uh, fault line and water seeping up into the fault line. You might see some of these beautiful birds there. This a vermilion flycatcher, a summer tanager is a bright red bird. I don't have a picture of that. The, this vermilion flycatcher is also a bright red bird. The Costas hummingbirds. Um, it's a really nice preserve and it's not far away and a lot of people don't know about it. So it's, it's uh, warm right now, but if you get out there in the morning, you might see a lot of wildlife. So that connects us to Joshua Tree. So before we move on to Joshua Tree, uh, I'll check again and see if anyone has questions or thoughts about um, these, these places, I see Lorraine says that the best hike in Morongo Canyon is the two car four mile hike from the entrance down the canyon to Indian Canyon Road. Oh, it's a four miles down. It's a car shuttle hike, right? Yeah, in the desert and you hike the, all the way down to Desert Hot Springs, but you need to have a car in both places. Uh, tried that once, but uh, ended up hiking a long ways <laughs> to get down there and back. Um, so we will go ahead and move on to 
Joshua Tree, which is the next connected park that is our closest national park with uh, lots of hiking trails, campgrounds, lots of interesting features, a $30 per car loan entrance fee. And uh, I like to remind people if they haven't been there that there's no food, there's no lodging, no services, no gas inside the park. Our outings leaders, Sierra Club outings leaders offered many hikes in the park um, from fall through spring over the winter and occasionally some car camping trips. So some of you are probably very familiar, maybe some of you haven't been there, but I was interested to see if people would uh, like to have a trail talk scheduled just about areas to see and hike in the national park. So maybe you could throw that in the chat if you'd be interested in a trail talk about the national park in some time. Where are we here? Plus, Joshua Tree doesn't even offer you water. Oh, right, there's one campground. That's right, water is... <laughs> um, if you camp at Black Rock Campground, which is kind of before you get to the main part of the park, you have to turn off the highway and it's kind of its own little section. There is water at that campground, but everywhere else there's, there's no water. Uh, it's dry camping. You bring everything you need, which is great because it keeps the park um, as natural as possible, uh, which when there's 3 million visitors in a year, that, that still is a, a, tough, a tough thing to do in this park. It's gotten so popular. Uh, this picture here is a view from the backside of uh, Ryan Mountain, I think, looking down. So let, let us know if you'd like a, if, us to talk more about Joshua Tree at another Another one, but I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about Joshua Tree in a different different way just now um, about saving our Joshua trees. The, uh, hopefully, some of you saw the newsletter and the article about um, Joshua trees and getting them listed as threatened species. Um, these are you know the iconic species, <laughs> Western Joshua Tree, but it's under threat of extinction because of climate change. Um, the heat, it's adapted to heat and dryness over the years, but not to the extreme heat and extreme drought that we're having now. And without permanent protection from development, um, we run the risk of actually losing the Western Joshua tree. It's a, a valuable part of our California deserts. Wildflower, drought, and development are all threats to Joshua trees. So listing it under the, I, that's misspelled there, California Endangered Species Act would help to set a precedent that would protect, that recognizes that other species might need protection from climate change. As we uh, work to ensure the future of our state and achieve our goal of protecting 30% of lands and waters by 2030. So in mid-June, the California Fish and Game Commission is gonna vote on whether or not to continue protecting Joshua trees. If you are interested in that, please um, send your message. Whoops. Oops, whoops, wrong way, wrong way, wrong way. There we go. Send your message to the uh, Fish and Game Commission and I'll drop this link into the chat here when, we're, when I'm done. This is just an automated message. There's been over 2,400 of them sent so far, I believe, to the Fish and Game uh, Commission asking for a yes vote on protecting the Joshua tree. And if you're even more concerned and like would like to get involved, we're going to have a um, uh, talk like this that will prepare people to participate in their in their meeting, the Fish and Game Commission meeting either in person or remote and tell them that you want them to protect the Joshua tree because having people do that during the meeting time is, is powerful. We all love our Joshua trees. These, this is a picture from, oh, I don't know, three or four years ago of a very healthy Joshua tree forest in the park, but we have lost many uh, to fire. We've lost um, trees to development. And as the town of Joshua tree gets, busier and busier 
and there's more development of glamping spaces. There's one on the books right now for 640 acres up near Pioneer. Um, uh, what's that called? Oh, <laughs> the Pipes Canyon um, up that way. There's a plan for 640 acre glamping resort that would add lots of traffic and, and problems and destroy a bunch of Joshua trees. So protecting them from development will help to preserve the ones that can still survive at some of the higher elevations when they're not affected by climate change. I will drop these two links in the chat. And um, really that is about all I had. And um, like I mentioned, uh, you know, unfortunately, Carla couldn't be here to share her information about some very important spaces up in the mountains. So I'd kind of like to open it up and I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah, so Lorraine um, mentioned that the Center for Biological Diversity has been the champion of the fight to keep Joshua trees from extinction. And she puts in a link for a site that gives more information and preparations for speaking at the meeting that you made. They are, they've been very much, uh, the, they're the ones that um, led the fight to get it protected. And uh, we are working closely with them. Uh, and this, this um, RSVP link that I mentioned is for a meeting that we're gonna have to um, help folks participate in that meeting. And uh, CBD is doing similar things. Um, National Parks Conservation Association is doing similar things. And um, I'm gonna get you the link right now. And Lori asks, why wouldn't fish and game want to protect Joshua trees? Uh, well, it's a good question. Unfortunately, there is uh, a lot of money in development. Development takes out Joshua trees. There's a big, um, push from solar, you know, large, industrial scale solar project, people don't want Joshua trees protected because then they can't, they either have to mitigate or they have to not build their projects where the um, Joshua trees are. So it's a, the um, commission votes, um, I believe, I think it's June, well, it's June 15th or 16th. We're not sure exactly what, which day yet um, public comment will be allowed, but as soon as that happens, anybody that signs up to participate will be um, advised of, you know, when you can participate. But the, the development is why they don't wanna do it. The developers are very, very powerful and they catch a lot of, uh, uh, people's ears and that are in power and they do not want the Joshua tree protected because then they would have to spend more money when they are um, wanting to build something. Lorraine, go ahead. Hi, thanks. I'm sorry I've been so uh, <laughs> vocal, so to speak. Here. Uh, <laughs> yes. you, you've, hit, you've hit on a whole bunch of issues I'm very involved in. I'm part of the Morongo Basin Conservation Association up here in the Morongo Basin. Um, but the, uh, as I understand it, the, um, the staff, the State Department staff made the report that there wasn't enough evidence that the tree should be um, uh, continued to be listed as a threatened species. Um, and there were some, I think Chris Clark of National mm -hmm. Parks Conservation Association um, and others have written or in his, in one of his podcasts uh, spoke about the fact that they had some external scientists review it. And, you know, most of them pointed out the errors in the state department staff report. But of course, <laughs> the things you said are true, uh, that, you know, if money can be made, then there is an interest in, in, in that. So, um, so the, uh, my understanding also, and this is the kind of thing you'll read in the biological diversity um, reports, the, um, the science is strong. And the commission, which is, you know, political appointment sort of, it has overturned the state report in past issues. So we're hoping for that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, that's that's exactly what uh, what I know too is that the um, 
you know, the staff report suggested that they not protect it, um, which carries quite a bit of weight, but they have not gone with the staff reports in the past. So we're hoping, we're hopeful that with a lot of uh, comment, a lot of public interest and um, uh, raising our voices that they will vote to protect it. So I just dropped into the chat two things. Um, the first one is the event that we're holding to get ready for the meeting to help people with talking points, how to get into the meeting, where to go if you want to actually show up in person. And then uh, the second one is uh, an email. Um, it's not an email, it's a, a link that you can get to a, um, an action alert and send a just a electronic, it would be an actual letter that would be printed out and taken to the Fish and Game Commission. So um, we will email this information to everyone on the call as well after we're through. And, and the other thing is, <clears throat> in case you don't know, you can save the chat. In the lower right hand corner, there's three little dots. And if you click on it, it drops down a menu. And the first item is save chat. So that's something you might want to do just before we finish. And you, that way you'll have all of these links saved in a file for you. Yes, and we will. Like I said, we will uh, email them. And Carol, um, did you want to talk a little bit about P P Heaps Peak Arboretum? I think that would be a, a real interesting um, thing for folks to hear about. Carol, you still with us? Carol, let's see. Yep, she's still here. She's mute. Carol, did did you want to? Oh, your phone is not working. Okay, well, thank you for putting that in the chat. Um, and I have I have not been there. I don't know if John has. No. Heaps Peak Arboretum, um, thirty thousand acres of land, a demonstration garden, Sequoia Trail, mile hike, and then uh, it's uh, on on Highway 18, just packed. Sky Park at Sanis Village. So each, uh, if you go to the, um, oh, okay. Hi, Carol, you're a friend of Carla's, yes. Good. Uh, well, thanks for adding that. That it would be probably one of the things she would have mentioned tonight. And she put the, the uh, web address for it. Yes, that's very helpful. The um, hparthparboretum.org. hparboretum.com.org. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Anybody else have uh, anything you'd like to um, add to nearby nature places or ask about? And John, there's a lot of other places we didn't cover. And John and I have led hikes all over the place. So if you have a, a question about a specific area, we might be able to answer it. Yeah, and we are, as, as Marianne mentioned, our outings program has restarted now in full force. Uh, there's quite a few outings available that you can sign up for. And um, a lot of the outings right now are up in the mountains, and you'll notice that a lot of them are strenuous because they are up in the mountains, and you usually have to, if you start hiking in the mountains, you end up going up. <laughs> so they are high altitude and strenuous, but as the weather cools in the fall and winter, we'll add more hikes that are not as difficult. And, and even now, Judy Atkinson does uh, moderate hikes up in the okay. mountains. So we'll, we'll try to get in some moderate and even some easy walks when, um, when we can, as we get more leaders and get started up again. So uh, with that, unless someone has someone else, something else to add, I think we're about done. John, do you have anything? No, I, I just want to put in a, a plug for my, uh, for those of you who are up to some strenuous hikes, put in a plug for my um, Seven Peaks of the Cucamonga Wilderness Patch Program. Um, we have started it, and uh, last week on Bighorn Peak, I awarded a patch to someone who had done six of the seven peaks in 2019. And then of course, because of COVID, we did nothing for two years. And he finished the seventh one last week. And uh, there's no time limit. You don't have to finish the seven peaks in one year. And I'm going, to, I've already done four of them, but I'm gonna repeat them at least one more time, maybe twice. I, I may do them three times 
during the hiking season. Some of them will be in the autumn. Um, so they are, they do tend to be strenuous, but if you're up for that, love to have you join me. Okay. I was just going back through the chat and um, I noticed Lorraine's comment about Joshua Tree, <laughs> don't come on the weekend. It is overrun. Um, the park is overrun. Parking is difficult. Um, the town is overrun with people. And um, there's so many new um, Airbnb type places to stay. It's, it's gotten very popular, which is great to see people enjoying outside. But um, it has gotten very crowded, so you want to pick the right, you know, if you can go on a non-week, on a weekday, uh, if you can go and uh, not, you know, and find some of the less popular places to, to walk around, and then probably not go right now because it is, it is quite warm. Um, so maybe, and I, I like your suggestion uh, about having something about, you know, some of the other areas like the Mojave Preserve has some amazing places to see. So we could we could talk about some other places in the desert that we all love that maybe are not as overly loved as Joshua Tree and, and introduce people to some of those places instead. So that might be even a better idea with a little bit about Joshua Tree. So I would be ready to say good night, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, our next talk, and I feel badly that I'm doing this again next month. You have to listen to me again, but uh, this is just how the schedule happened to work out that I ended up doing this one um, and the next one about uh, Sierra Club National river rafting trips and not necessarily going on a national one, Sierra Club one, but there's, it's a, I took my first one last year and it was a lot of fun and I thought I'd give a little bit of information on on river rafting trips. And these are not just like a day thrill seeking rafting trip. These are five, six nights camping along the river to see the um, amazing scenery that you don't get to see any other way. So that's next month. So with that, thank you and good night, everyone. John, can you stick on for just a few minutes? I'm gonna stop the recording now.